Hey folks, I'm here at Fountain Square in downtown Bowling Green, Kentucky. It's a chilly October afternoon. You know, it's a really beautiful square and it's also a beautiful time for food in this country. We have artisan breads, artisan cheeses, craft beers. Right around the corner, there's something called Corsair Artisan Distillery. Now, just what is an artisan distillery? Come along with me and let's go around the corner and find out. Clay Smith, homeboy, fellow from Glasgow, Kentucky, my hometown, and we're here at Corsair Artisan Distillery. Yes. We're in your ante room, the entrance way, and basically, Clay, I want you to tell the folks what makes an artisan distillery. An artisan distillery or a craft distillery uh, generally produces a whole lot less than some of the larger distilleries you may have heard of, mm -hmm. uh, such as Jim Beam or you know, Maker's Mark or these guys. Um, we are going to produce, we always give our tours in, in, in a way that says, we're going to produce less this year than those guys are going to spill today. And that's mm. not so far from the truth. So, yeah. Okay. It, it means, it, generally, it's, it, it refers to the production levels and, and what we're capable of doing. So you're making a small amount of spirits, mm -hmm. or you're, you're distilling a small amount of spirits. Uh, you have a limited distribution, yes. I suppose. Well, give us a little bit of history of the distillery. How'd you all come about? Well, Corsair started. Uh, the two owners are actually from Nashville. Uh, and when they got started, they were interested in, uh, they were actually working on a biofuels project. Hmm. Uh, and <laughs> but the biofuels project that they were working on was actually a very dirty business, very, you know, the government hasn't quite caught up with a lot of the legislation that should support those, those types of industries right. just yet. And uh, they weren't getting a lot of bang for their buck out of, out of a lot of work that they were doing. So uh, one day, Andrew looked at Derek and said, you know, I'd be a whole lot happier if that barrel over there was, was full of whiskey instead of biofuels. And, and then, so I said, all right, let's take the challenge. Let's, let's, let's do it. Let's start making whiskey. Okay. So here, you're just distilling and you're bottling. And in Nashville... They distill, they bottle, but do you also have like a, a pub or something down there? We, we do. We kind of inherited it from the folks who owned the space before. Um, here in Bowling Green, we have, um, we do all of our core products, which is our gin, our vanilla bean vodka, our spice rum, and our absinthe. And when they got started, they, those are unaged products. So they were wanting to get something on the market very quickly that would allow them to make some money while we were doing some experimentation with the whiskeys, which is what we're kind of known for and, and more interested in, in, in pursuing. Well, I know you all do some strange stuff. I see your copper pot still in here. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go to the other room, and I sure. want you to tell me, show me the still and tell me about the distillation process. Sure. Right, let's do it. Coming up, Clay talks about the science of distillation and shows off Corsair's beautiful copper pot still. All right, folks, we're here in front of this really cool, beautiful, actually, copper pot still. Still very hot from the distilling process. Um, Clay, I want, to, I want you to tell us about this still and also something about the distillation. Like, how, how does distilling go down? Okay, uh, easy enough. Uh, this still is our 50-gallon pot still, or, uh, so we can, we can charge the still with 50 gallons. It was commissioned four years ago from Vendome Copper and Brassworks in Louisville. Uh, a little over four years ago. The company's just about uh, four and a half years old. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of a hybrid design of one of uh, the, the owners. When, when they started, they were looking for something that was very versatile. They were looking for a still that could do a, a number of different things, not just, not just whiskeys, not just you know, vodka or gin production. Um, what they were looking for was basically what we refer to as the Batmobile. <laughs> It, uh, it's very, it only her, holds a very small amount, right. but it can do pretty much anything you want to okay. do. Um, like our, a Swiss Army knife. Yeah, very much so. So um, 
We also have a 250 gallon pot still down at our Nashville location that is a pre prohibition era gin still. That one used to be here, right? It did used to be and here, it, and, and it, was, and it was the taller one that was up the, in, in this area. So, yeah. Go ahead. Um, but that one uh, is kind of like a Mack truck in, in, in the same sort of sense. Uh, it can hold a lot, and it does one thing very, very well. And what, is, what does the huge steel do well, and what does this one do? That one does better. straight whiskeys very well. Um, it, it holds a lot more. We can, we can run off a whole lot more product in, in one pass. This, okay. one, uh, this one's a little bit more versatile, and it does a lot of the trickier distills for the whiskeys uh, a lot better. So you all do what kind of spirits in this steel right here? We do our gin production, our absinthe production, and uh, and many of our other tricky whiskey kind of things. And what I say, what I mean by tricky whiskeys is it, the type of equipment that this particular still has, and I'll, I'll tell you about that. Um, is is meant for uh, for inst instilling the the alcohol with uh, the flavors of the whiskeys that we want uh, in them in the end. So. This particular so the features of this one, uh, if you look up the, the portholes here, mm -hmm. we have what's... You're talking about these yeah. things right here? Yeah, yep. that's what's called a, a bubble cap or a plate. It's a, it's a secondary condensing unit that allows us to force the vaporized alcohol through a layer of liquid, thus cleaning the, the, the alcohol and uh, letting us control very finely how fast or how slow the alcohol comes over uh, and what type of flavor profiles we're, we're pulling off of it. Um, the second thing that makes it a little bit different is that top little section right at the top. Yes, that's what's called a deflagmator, and that is a copper, in, or excuse me, it has a number of copper tubes that are crisscrossed in throughout the interior of the chamber, so that we can pump cold water through that. Yes, and cool the airspace around the, that copper tubing, thus only allowing a little bit of the alcohol in, or one type of element that we're distilling off at a time. So what do you add to your gin? Well, the big components in, in, in a traditional gin is juniper and cardamom, and ours has a number of citrus elements, uh, orange peel, citrus peel, um, and the way that we produce our gin is the third feature of this still. Uh, it's called the Carter Head, or the vapor basket. Okay. This chamber right here, we can fill with just about any type of botanical matter, uh, vegetal matter, or spice matter that we want to infuse the alcohol as it's coming off the still. Um, so you have the, herbs in here, you have vapor coming through that takes on the flavors of whatever kind of botanicals that you're putting in there? Right. It, it takes a lot of the, the lighter elements, the lighter oils from, from the botanicals, and leaves a lot of the heavier stuff behind. So when, you, when you're tasting our gin, it's much more clean, it's much more broad uh, in terms of its citrusy and, and yeah. And that and citrus sweetness. comes from, you said, what kind of? Orange additions? peel and lemon peel. Very nice. Up next, we learn how Corsair is breaking the mode of conventional spirits with edgy experimentation and atypical grains. some weird stuff in your spirit making. The main grains for whiskey making are barley for Scotch and Irish whiskeys, corn for bourbon, rye for Canadian whiskey, uh, wheat for some bourbons, etc. You all are using some strange grains. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what goes into basically what those strange grains create? Sure. Uh, the majority of our whiskeys uh, are, are malted barley based. But uh, we're also interested in looking at the alternative types of grains, uh, such as triticale, quinoa, anything that's a fermentable sugar that is possible for us to actually combine with barley and make an, a different type of whiskey profile out of. Quinoa is a very small, round grain. Yeah. Um, a lot of the hippies eat it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you make with quinoa? Uh, we have our, our quinoa whiskey, which is... Uh, is Combined with the with the barley to make a, a malted malted whiskey, so um, it has a very different form uh, taste of it. It's a very different character than uh, than your typical malted whiskey. You're going to get a, a, some nuttiness, some a little bit of um, uh, 
a little bit of a starkness to it, um, and almost like the grain itself. I mean, the grain is a very old grain. Uh, you know, people have been using you know using that as food for for very ancient since the ancient times. You know, I mean, so I'd say it's really dry and also has a sweetness on the the aftertaste. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have quinoa. That's good. Yeah, quinoa, and, and what else? What other kind of strange grains? Well, we're interested in, in, in combining those, uh, kind of following up from the craft beer boom uh, of the past 10 to 15 years. We're interested in seeing what hops kind of do with uh, with whiskeys as well. So we have a, a few hop with hopped whiskeys that are some are ready for production, and some are, are not quite quite ready for production just yet. So, so, so for the novice, what are hops exactly? Hops are the the sort of flower of of a vine, okay, uh, and they're a chief component in, in, in beer making to make it bitter. Uh, the the lupulin that comes from from hops are is uh, is this sticky sort of uh, stuff that is down in the the hop flower that that comes uh, through in the beer making process. So traditionally, in a beer making process, when you start out a whiskey and you start out a, a beer, they they both start out the, their lives the same way. You start a mash. So you add water to it and, and you heat it up. Uh, but we're doing it in a, in a little bit different of a fashion. We're taking our hops and adding it in into the alcohol phase. Okay. So uh, in our Carter head, the same way that we produce our gin. So we're pulling those those heavy oils uh, through a much lighter process. To, so we get the not as much of a bittering, but a little bit more of the floral and the character of the hop comes through. So you all have been getting accolades from far outside the region. Uh, I think people are really interested in what you're doing because you are doing funky stuff. Hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the kind of publicity you've had that from faraway places? Pub- <laughs> yes, uh, most media places have been very kind to us, uh, very interested in what we're what we're doing. We've won uh, 41 awards over the past four years for for various spirits, uh, ranging from everything from our gin to our old punk, which is our, our seasonal um, pumpkin spice moonshine that's been aged. Um, so, I mean, we. We've been, uh, you know, just kind of racking them up, I guess, uh, for for quite a while now. We won uh, San Francisco Spirits gold medal straight out of the gate, less than a couple, you know, right around a couple months after they had opened. Well, thanks, guys, for the distillation education and for giving us a rundown of the cool stuff you're doing. Absolutely, anytime. Mm-hmm.